The lower green has kind of been a gray area for us. We know that fish move through it. We've found fish in it. We don't know if they're staying in it. As we invest millions and millions of dollars in restoration, we want to know if the fish are actually going to be using it. We really need to be sure that we are spending our money in the most effective way possible, and we're doing it in the best place possible. I'm Chris Gregerson. I'm a fisheries ecologist with King County. We're here today at Icy Creek in the Middle Green River, and we are tagging yearling Chinook salmon. And I will show you how it goes. So this is the anesthesia. You can see him getting sleepy. So when I'm tagging these fish, I tag them towards the tail, and the idea is that I'm putting the tag into the body cavity. I'm doing it towards the tail to make sure I avoid any organs, and I'll go at a slanted angle to keep the needle from actually penetrating into the stomach cavity the tag and I can go ahead scan the tag it pops up on the reader I'll measure the fish 125 and save and then I can return the fish into a recovery tank this new study is using some new technology to help us track these fish each one of these is a preloaded needle that has a tag inside of it when you push this button the tag comes out of the needle just like that. This allows us to tag fish down to 45 millimeters. So in the Green River, this is important to us because we know the fish less than 60 are the ones that aren't surviving to adulthood. So we've been wanting to know what's happening to those fish. We also have a new antenna that is capable of detecting fish in a big river system. This is allowing us to actually tag the fish each one gets a unique identification number with the code. The tag will stay with this fish its entire life, so we're able to track it as it moves throughout the system. So this differs quite a bit from um, the majority of our fish work that we do. Going out and catching a fish, say through electrofishing or seining or observing them snorkeling, you get to see them one time. It's just a snapshot of their use. You know, okay, they were using this habitat at this time, but you don't know how they got there, how long they've been there, and if those fish are going to survive and come back as adults. This is kind of giving us the missing link to do that. So we've done over 3,000 Seuss Creek hatchery fish and then about 1,000 wild fish from the screw trap and from other places in the lower green tributaries. Fish that we release up at the WDFW screw trap, that's kind of the top end of the lower green. Between where they're released and detected here, that gives us a good picture of what are happening to these fish throughout their whole lower green experience. We found this spring that um, the smaller the fish, the more time they spent in the lower green. The larger fish tend to move through really quickly. The smaller fish stuck around for uh, upwards of two months. And that is important to us because as these fish grow, their habitat needs change pretty drastically. When they emerge from the gravel, they need really shallow, slow, protected areas out of the current. They're just tiny, really vulnerable to predation, so they have very specific habitat needs, and as they grow, they can transition into more open water, um, finally transitioning into the main river as they smolt and moving out. So based on understanding what size these fish are when they're staying in the river, we can tailor our designs of our habitat projects to provide that type of habitat for these fish. The lower green has been a little bit of a mystery. We know that fish are coming out of the middle green at this fry size, these, these small little fish. Um, we know a lot of them are not surviving to come back to the Green River to, to spawn. We just didn't know though, if we create the habitat, are they gonna use it? And I think this research really points to the fact that we can't just kind of overlook this whole urban basin, that we really have to think creatively, whether that's setting back a levee, whether it's removing a fish passage barrier and a small tributary that we've never really thought much of, but now we know because of Chris's research that those fish are using that little tributary to rear during those winter months. So I think it just pushes us to think more creatively and keep making a strong argument this basin is worth it and we should be focusing our resources here. These, these fish are important to the tribes, the Duwamish, the Muckleshoot tribes. These fish as adults, um, we know that orcas are feeding fairly heavily on them. There's a lot of emphasis on saving these fish, but these fish in general are going to tell us what we need to do to make sure there's more of them. If we can provide the most meaningful restoration possible, then we can produce more adults that benefit everybody, orcas and humans alike.